much for holding this conference, Tom, and the other people that have been involved in the organization. It has been a great day and a real learning experience. And I'd also like to congratulate MTO because I was down there, participated in one of their training sessions and saw some of the work that they were doing and it was really great. Um, Hydro One has to maintain vegetation on approximately 82,000 hectares of land on transmission corridor stretching between the Manitoba border and the Quebec border and from James Bay down to Windsor. We also have about 100,000 hectares of distribution property on which to maintain vegetation oh, along with um, 1,000 distribution stations and 285 transformer stations. To complicate the situation, the government owns about a third of the transmission corridors and two thirds of the property is under easement. So we don't have control of all the property. Hydro One's mandate is to provide the people of Ontario with safe and reliable delivery of electricity in a cost effective manner. So to do a lot of projects, we have to make business cases and justify the work that we do. There are a lot of legislation requirements that we must abide by. The major one that we have to abide by is North American Reliability Corporation Standards and the Ontario Electricity Safety Code, which tells us how far the vegetation has to be away from the electrical conductors. But then, like a lot of the other people have discussed today, there are other requirements from, that we have to abide by. And some of these are from railways, pipelines, Ministry of Transportation, Transport Canada. There's also a ream of environment, environmental legislation that we have to follow, such as um, the Migratory Bird Convention Act, the Environmental Protection Act, environmental assessments, and on and on the legislation goes. One of the things that we like to do, though, for the um, species at risk, we like to start off when Casero is c considering various species. And we go to the Casero meetings to find out why species are being listed or what they're being listed as, whether they're threatened or endangered, and here, some of the studies that are going on and the recommendations. Um, then we try to follow the legislation right through the EBR postings and input into these. Now going back to Hydro One, there are two facets that really um, species at risk or how we could affect species at risk. One is the vegetation maintenance. We go through on one of the transmission right-of-ways or distribution right-of-ways. And we control vegetation about every six to eight years that we have to knock the vegetation successional stage back again. So over about 100 years, we keep going through and through and knocking the vegetation back quite often to like a prairie kind of stage or a meadow. And then we let the trees grow up again and then we knock them back again. In the urban areas though, we're frequently cutting the grass three to six times a year. Uh, the other thing that we do on the right of way is just upgrade the facilities or we may construct new transmission lines. And I'll get into that a bit later. When it comes to our vegetation maintenance, where am I with our slides? We do have various things that we try to do, some tools that we use. We, are, we have a, a guide to um, endangered species that we started about 30 years ago, and we're trying to keep update and give access to all the employees. We also have a mitigation guide now for the employees so that if we think there are any on our right of way, the first step that we could take to mitigate anything that might happen to these species. We also use the NHIC database to um, see what may be in the area before we go into it. We're also starting a new GIS mapping program where we're inputting any restrictions that have occurred on the right of way before or what MNR has told us and so that we can share it between the various groups within Hydro. 
So, and then we go to M&R and ask them if they have any new information on the right-of-way before we go in to maintain it. In areas that we have special treatments, we are posting signs to say that we have a special treatment area. Um, last year, we got a phone call from a counselor in Hamilton to say that um, there were eastern meadowlarks and savannah sparrows that one of his constituents was quite concerned about in the Olympic Drive area. And one of the first things we did was we stopped mowing the right-of-way. And when we stopped mowing the right-of-way, we started to get complaints from neighbors to say that they were afraid that coyotes or deer may move into the corridor. But we mowed the area about six meters from the property line, from the fences for the residential property. And um, we got an email from a resident to say that he'd lived there for 15 years and it was the first time that they had a nesting pair of bobolinks there and he thanked us for keeping the area um, unmowed. Now, this is a slide of our Bruce to Milton project. We had about the early 90s, late 80s, we built the Bruce by Milton transmission line. And then again, we were going, we had to build a new line to parallel the existing line between the Bruce nuclear generating station on the shores of Lake Huron to our Milton transformer station and around the James Snow Parkway in the Highway 401. And again, we had to start off by doing the typical planning for the new line. So we did the ecological land class. We did National Heritage Information Center data. We collected um, information from doing biological studies along the way and looking at species at risk along the proposed corridor. When we did, after we had done all the studies, um, we were having our consultation pro process actually around the same time. And one of the things that we had done historically for 30 years, we'd done a tree by tree replacement pro program. Well, during the consultation process, we thought, well, why are we doing tree by tree replacement? You know, we've been doing this on and on for years. Is there something better? And what we got to thinking was, well, why not do habitat creation or habitat betterment? So we started to think outside the box. We had about four workshops that were devoted to biodiversity, and we invited representatives from MNR, the Conservation Authority, NEC, First Nations, Stewardship Councils, interest groups, and municipalities. And we asked them, for their experience and advice on how to set up the framework for doing biodiversity projects and ask them about what they thought about um, how to approach the evaluation and selecting projects. So we got the input from them and then we went through the various, we sent out letters actually to the various groups asking for interest in proposals for the enhancement of habitat. One of the basic things that we wanted though were the projects to be located on public lands. We ended up by going through the projects that were submitted to us and we selected 22 different projects with seven different partners. And the projects were varied from tall grass prairie to pit and mound woodlands. Uh, this is an example of one of the projects that was selected. It's at Chief's Point up on the Bruce Peninsula, and it was a project that we did with the Saugeen Ojibwe Nation out there. And what, what it was was a plan, and they used um, traditional ec ecological knowledge and information from the San elders and their own field crews. And they um, transported some plants from the right of way they did an inventory and removal of Phragmites in the area. They planted buffer plants around the marsh. They created hibernacula for the rattlesnakes 
in enhanced habitat for landing turtles. So they ended up by doing um, habitat enhancement on a total of 18 hectares. So if we had done the traditional um, tree for tree replacement, we would have replaced about 280 hectares of trees. When we did it for the biodiversity habitat enhancement, we enhanced 380 hectares of habitat. And there is um, a hill's thistle that was in the um, Chief's Point area, and it's endangered. One of our challenges on the Bruce to Milton project, though, was trying to obtain um, an overall benefit permit for a butternut tree. We had done the um, assessments of a few butternut trees that were on the path of the corridor, and only one tree was required to be um, removed. So anyway, we went through the process of trying to develop a planting plan, which we thought was going to be an easy thing to do. But it turned out that, you know, under the requirements that we needed to collect to, um, what we needed to do was to have stock from the same seed zone as the tree that we were removing. And one of the people that I worked with, they phoned every nursery in Ontario trying to find the stock, and there was no stock available. But it was good that m and did come along and they found stock for us that we were able to use. Then we were supposed to um, find a place to plant this stock, and um, that was a very difficult thing to do because Again, they wanted it planted near where it was going to be, where the tree was being removed. Well, we couldn't find anywhere that we could logically plant there, but we did ha find a site on our own property um, just west of Barry that was still in the same seed zone, and we ended up by planting there. We had to go and do um, soil testing to make sure that the soil was all right. We had the nursery that, or the uh, stock that they had found had already been DNA tested. And so we ended up by planting 30 seedlings in this site, along with 30 other trees, which were a combination of black cherry and red oak. Because of our difficulty of trying to find the butternut stock, we did make a donation to the Forest Gene Conservation Authority, uh, Association, so that the next time that we need to find stocks, we should be able to find it for that seed zone. So, yeah, I am. The challenges that we have found um, is that hydro has an extensive area to maintain. We have a lot of legislation to satisfy, along with the delivery of electricity. Um, when we're planning projects, we can't fall into the lull and think that time is on our side. It takes a good year to do the field studies, and it can take a long time to get an overall benefit permit. Um, we too have had challenges dealing with different districts of MNR, and we have also had challenges finding different areas on which to work for overall benefit permits. And we are constantly under pressure to keep costs down. And I think you'll find that our tips for success are very similar to other people, what other people have expressed today. You need engagement from the president of the company on down to the workers in the field. And I do commend m and in this legislation that it has made us do some training with the lower levels. It's made us do cases to the president and the board on species at risk and preserving them. It's extremely important to be involved with the legislation from the Casero right down to the stakeholder groups. It is important to build relationships and partnerships. And monitoring is very is important to monitor the outcomes.